Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. Our speaker for Relationships Week was Woody Morwood. Woody has been involved in young adult and student ministries for over 30 years. He earned his Doctorate of Ministry at Azusa Pacific University and currently serves as campus pastor at Hillside Community Church in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Woody comes to us as guest of the Center for Healthy Relationships. Back. You're stuck with me. Okay, here's the deal. You guys made it way too fun. I don't want to go home yet. Um, is there a way I could stay a little bit longer? I haven't been to John's Coffee yet. I haven't done any hikes around here. I haven't, you know, there's little things that I hear. When's the first basketball game? I got to go buy some toilet paper, right? You got that coming up? Is that two weeks, three weeks, something like that? All the fun things are still to come and I don't get to do them. So do this, enjoy them without me. Last Tuesday, I got to talk with you though. And I tried to get scripture in front of us to create a vision that we might even think isn't possible, but with God, it is possible. And we studied and we looked at lions and bears and vipers and little kids and goats and lambs doing life together, lounging around in hammocks out in the quad area, eating and joking and doing life together because God changed their appetites enough that they weren't devouring, ruining, manipulating, using each other in ways that only benefited themselves. We're talking about relationships and friendships. And Isaiah started to paint a picture for us so that you and I could get away from our expectations of what we think friendship could be and actually put it in the space where God and only God could create it to be something so unique and special. It might be called a crazy hope-filled zoo. I did something in classes. I went to five classes with you and you are a sharp crowd. Um, We will pray for all of your professors and all of your uh, student life staff because I think you guys ask great hard questions and you are wrestling with real truth and you wanna see the world be different. And as I was sitting there in those classes and I gave out cards, I asked a question. I said, hey, can you define friendship for me? And everybody that was in those classes came up with a definition of friendship. I had the class turn the card over and I asked three questions. The first question was this, do you have a friend like what you described on the front of your card? And the answers were all over the place, but I'll tell you a little bit about what some of them said in a second. And then there was the second one and it was, are you that type of friend to others? Today is based on some of those responses that I saw in a great passage of scripture that I can't wait to read to you. And I have another painting for you to look at, but this time it's not some famous painter, it's amazing artists at APU that painted it for me. Here's what I learned with those questions that I asked. Most of you that were in those classes, and it was just under 10% because about 120 some people responded to those cards. On number two, you know what they said, most of them, when it came to, am I that type of friend? I heard language like, I hope so, I think so. There were very few, absolutely, here's the model, this guy's got it all taken care of, just have everybody come see me when they wanna know about friendship. And I actually really appreciated that and I had no idea that that's what you would put. The first observation I want you to have is we're getting ready to study a passage of scripture is this. I think JBU students have a willing spirit to acknowledge they don't have friendship figured out. And I think that's the healthiest thing in the entire world. I hate an expert when they're not an expert and they act like an expert. But I love it when somebody's willing and open and has a posture where they want to become something different. Here's the second thing that I learned in the cards. When you guys said you had a friend, I would say almost in the 90 plus percentile of those cards that were filled out, when the answer was yes, it usually defined one friend or somewhere around three to four friends. Most of the conversation was around a small pocket of people. It was very personal. It was probably a high expectation for depth, a lot of time and an energy. But what was interesting that I saw was missing that I'll talk a little bit that could be another possibility for you considering this hope-filled crazy zoo because it's not real fun if you only have four animals in a zoo. 
is that friendship could be something that is even much broader than just one person, three or four, even though that feels safer, there could be a safety that's completely different when that is broadened. And so what I also got in the class was this. A lot of you said, hey, where's the practical? How do we do the hope-filled zoo? And because of how a lot of you responded with that willingness to learn, this is what I'm going to say about how, and then we'll work through Romans chapter 12. The how is more focused on your posture than even your performance. You got to promise me something here. As you listen to Romans 12, and if I give you ideas on how to maybe do Christ-centered friendships and some things that you could try, do not go into performance mode and go, this week I'm going to accomplish all 10 of these and prove that I am a friend. What I want you to do is begin to be open to a posture where those things might actually start naturally coming out of you. And you'll go, oh, I tried one and there was some fruit with it. God, help me to keep learning that and being in the middle of that. This whole conversation around friendship really is more about attitude, willingness, and then God creating the spaces for those things to actually happen. I'm going to start with the painting. I told you guys that I had a bunch of students at APU paint this for me. And uh, as you look at this painting, I want you to imagine Romans chapter 12. There were students that read through Romans chapter 12 probably 20 plus times with me. There was five of them that did multiple sketches. We'd come back together and I would say, I like that part, that part, that part, and that part. And they'd all go sketch again. And then they came back together and a student finally said, hey, I got an idea. Instead of us all sketching, why don't we all sketch one thing together? And after about three weeks or so, they created this. They imagined what it was like to have a posture in Romans 12 to live out this community, this type of friendship. You can see people in an argument. You can see people getting along. You can see people praying for each other. You can see people with a hand on a shoulder. You can see people with distance still trying to figure out how to come towards each other rather than away from them. And this photo that was of a painting became a symbol for our community and it was almost like we never do this perfect but we can't wait to have the posture to see what God might do it in us. And so as you think about this I want to give you a framework for Romans chapter 12. Somebody a hundred times smarter than me, uh, uh, Dr. David Asberger from Fuller wrote a book called Dissident Discipleship and he talked about tripolar spirituality. I'm one of those guys that need it to be really clean and simple to figure out how I do life. And he describes spirituality like this. There is an upward obedience. There is an inner kind of commitment and, and directed energy. So upward obedience, inwardly directed, which will then help us to be outwardly committed. And Romans 12 and what you saw on that uh, uh, photo, that painting will hint at that. You had some of the people in the painting looking up like, dear Lord, help me to be community and friend because I don't know how to do it. You, you saw some of that internal directed kind of focus. Dear Lord, oh, help me pay attention to who I am because I don't like what's coming out of me. And then you saw that outward commitment as people were drawing close together and putting a hand on one another, praying for each other, doing life together. And I'm going to work through three sections of Romans 12 and hopefully you'll be able to kind of start to hear things that will prompt you to go, I think I can have a posture like that. I've never had a posture like that before. I'm curious about that. Maybe I'll pray about that. Or man, I've seen somebody else have a posture like that and it screams in the most beautiful way, friendship, friendship, friendship. God, would you help that posture happen in me? And I'll start with Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, but I'm not gonna put that scripture on the screen because I'm just gonna kind of quote it, kind of read it really quick and make you think for a second so we can focus on three other passages because we only got a little bit of time for a whole chapter. Listen to Romans 12, verse one. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. Some translations say, in view of God's mercies. If I had written it, it would be in view of all the things my dear and gracious Lord has saved me from. It goes on, it says, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed 
to this world, and I'm going to add in there, or its standards on friendship, relationships, and how to do life together, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. For all the Bible scholars and any professors or faculty, you know that chapter 12 is a hinge moment between chapters 1 and 11 and then 12. And 1 through 11 talk about Christ crucified, Christ dead in the grave, Christ raised from the dead, and now in heaven with God able to shape what is being prepared for a final conclusion. And in that, the church has been given the Holy Spirit to live radically different. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 is basically saying what we talked about in Isaiah is possible in pieces and in moments and in spaces when people are ready for God to reign. And so this whole process of this is a renewing of our mind. And here's what I'm hoping you guys will do throughout this year. Because at ABU, I used to hate it when we called things weeks. We had to have theme weeks. You needed theme weeks. But they really should have been like a life theme uh, kind of thing rather than a week thing. What I'm hoping is you'll take relationships and friendships and this will be something that you will dream about, pray about, be transformed, be renewed, that you will live radically different because you view and know God's mercy, which is this upward kind of just obedience so that you can inwardly be directed and you outwardly can be committed in ways that will never look the same. I was trying to think of a real example of this in the scriptures, and I turned to John chapter 15. Do you know the word friend is in John chapter 15? I told you on Tuesday that neighbor, community, ecclesia, church, all those things kind of hint at relational type components, but chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus actually uses the word friend, and it's kind of in a unique spot. It says this, Jesus was talking with his disciples and his words were this, I do not call you servants any longer because a servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Okay, those of you that have ever been in a bad friendship, do you realize Jesus is sitting at a table at the last supper knowing that people are gonna basically ghost him? Uh, that are going to bolt on them. They're going to betray them. They're going to talk bad about them. They're going to be done with them. And some will even come to the crucifixion from a distance and try not to be seen by anybody else. And Jesus looks at them at the Last Supper and in view of God's mercy tells them, you are friends. You know what God's up to. You know what I'm up to. And I know what you're up to. And even though you're going to choke here really badly, I am calling you friends. I got to tell you this, uh, JBU, when I live at my best God self and God is doing a beautiful work in me, I cannot help but imagine this friendship here and how might God help do a friendship this way. Do you know what I'm the worst friend? Do you know what I'm the most honorary friend? Is when I'm not being a good friend this way. Can I give you the first most practical thing, a posture to hold? If you want to develop what it means to be a friend to this world or a tight friend to two or three or a gracious sacrificial friend to everybody else, can I just tell you this friendship right here is absolutely the most defining thing you could spend your time and energy doing. You got great friends, but they do not want your worst self. They don't want your grouchy self. They don't want your selfish self. By the way, any other selfish people in this room or I'm the only one? I'm a recovering selfaholic. Um, uh, you want your relationship with Jesus in view of God's mercy to change everything and how you see others. And it will. As I was kind of thinking this through, what that would mean in a lot of different ways is it basically, um, it defines everything. And what it will define is things like this, how we look at ourselves, how we're inwardly directed so we can be outwardly com committed. And I want to read a passage to you, and I'm going to tell you this as we keep going through Romans. I will have no ability to focus in on everything, but I've pulled one or two things out of each passage. But I love the work of the Holy Spirit, and I know the Holy Spirit can point something else out to you. So do this. Be wide open for the passage, and then be ready for one or two suggestions. In the inwardly directed space, listen to what Romans 12, 3 through 5 says. It says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, 
in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. The first part of this uh, whole piece of verses three through five start to focus in on what it means to not think too highly of ourselves, but the second part is so important, but to also not think too lowly of ourselves. Did you hear the language in there when it talks about thinking of ourselves with sober judgment? That isn't just to beat the tar out of ourselves and talk bad about ourselves. It's actually going to say, hey, in view of God's mercies, there's some really good things that when God is at work moving in my life and in my heart and in my soul, some beautiful things can happen. What it really is describing here is a beautiful, humble spirit that is absolutely ready for God to shape who I will be when people are watching, when people are not watching, when I'm with one person, when I'm with five people, or when I'm with an entire crowd of people that I don't think too highly of myself and I don't think too lowly of myself. Some of the crazy research that's out right now and what's, what I love is, is Dr. Gary Oliver can tell you all these details. We were in a conversation last night. If you're ever bored, just wanna have a great conversation, you need to walk into that office. Do you know loneliness, anxiety, and depression used to be a pretty high percentage for those that were by themselves who were in retirement or lost their spouse. But in the last couple of years, those numbers have come closer to the 18 to the 25 year old bracket. This piece of not thinking too highly of yourself and not thinking too lowly of yourself and view of God's mercy is one of the best antidotes in the entire world to have the God who created us and know us and love us to help us have a proper view of ourselves so we don't have to run this life full of anxiety and heaviness. And what's so beautiful about the rest of this passage, I told you I couldn't preach on every piece of it. We won't talk about the, the body and all the different beauty of uh, uniqueness and unity and all that. But if you skip to the end of that, there is a line that's just really simple. And it says, and each member belongs to all the others. Do you know I'm reading people right now that are saying psychologists and counseling is the greatest thing in the world, but many of the psychologists are saying if people were actually good friends to each other and mentors and church members actually watched out for one another, it might be interesting and we might appreciate it if some of us didn't have to work so hard because the body would take care of the body. Counseling is a sweet space to have a safe, safe spot to unload. But you know, some of those safe spaces on issues or things that are heartbroken or things that need to be untangled in significant ways can also be done with a friend that could change life forever and you could be an ear for them and they could be an ear for you. Some of the practical things that are happening in this passage are really about community. You saw the painting. There were some real dynamic tensions and beautiful moments and healthy moments. And the classes I was in with you, I know those are happening here. Don't grow weary in living those out. You belong to one another. Not just to one person, not just to five, but if you are in the JBU family, if you are in the kingdom of God, if you are a Christ follower, in view of God's mercy, giddy up, you all belong to each other. Now how good will you be to one another? This passage is so inspiring to me because it pushes me in so many different ways to think about things differently. Can I give you one? Here's, here's something to throw in there that you might think of as a posture. Can I encourage you to be more generous with the word friend? but don't be flippant with it. Last night, I got dropped off at my car by someone that I am really starting to appreciate and enjoy company with. And I got out of my car and I'm picking up my yard sale because I always have stuff scattered everywhere and hoping I didn't leave my phone or my keys or my sunglasses on the seat or in the uh, floor or something like that. And I'm kind of like hobbling over the car and I hear a voice behind me said, thank you, friend. That was a great dinner tonight. And I just got the biggest smile on my face. I'm like, yeah, a friendship. Over the last 20 years, I have tried to use the word friend in a very beautiful, generous way, like I had to figure out how to use I love you. I dated my wife five years before we got married. And about year two and a half, I finally got the guts to say the L word. And it felt like it came out something like this. I love you. 
You're just so scared to say it because you don't want to get rejected. You don't want to get ruined. You're not sure if you totally believe it yet. You're not sure all that it means. Did I just buy a new car? What is this all about? Do you know, I think saying the word friend feels the same way. We're a little scared to call somebody a friend because it means we're now might be committed and I can't have other friends or what does that look like? I have started to be generous with the word friend and try to live it out that I would say probably on any given day when I really mean it and live it well, I will either text it or say it to people up to 15, 20 times a day because I'm trying to live into it. I'll start a text. Hey, friend, what are you doing this afternoon? You got any time to go for a walk or something? And I may not even have all the time that I need to have with them to be a deep friend, but I am trying to live into something and suggest the crazy hope-filled uh, zoo before it ever has even totally been lived out yet. Suggestion for you to try on is that concept of be generous with the word friend. Someone may have never been called a friend in their entire life and you may change their whole trajectory of a semester or a year. Here's the second thing that I heard you guys talk about. I'd love for you to try on, especially in this space when it comes to being inwardly directed. I heard a lot of people say they were so discouraged because they haven't found a friend yet and uh, a true friend, a, a big definition friend and they're a freshman and it's been all of six weeks. Do you know friendship takes a really long time? Can I just normalize something here? If you're six weeks into this and you're a freshman or if you're a transfer or if you're even your second year here and you still don't feel like you can call somebody friend, don't worry, nobody knew that they just couldn't throw out friendship really, a uh, friend really casually. But here's the deal. It's actually kind of normal. Your faculty are so wise. I was in a conversation and a faculty member said, hey Woody, do you know that there's research on this? 40 to 60 hours it takes for most people uh, before they ever feel like they can say they have a casual friend. 80 to 100 hours before they would ever say that they kind of know a little bit about their story. And they were saying 200 plus hours before you could uh, really feel like you had someone that was significant. In college, you know how you guys are running all over the place? You know how long it's going to take to get 200 hours worth of quality time or even 60 hours of quality time? Can I tell you, will you please look at all four years of this experience as a, God, help me figure out friendship. Let me try some things on. Let me say some things. Give me permission to investigate what friendship is rather than I need one or three perfect friends. And if I don't find them, I'm going to be a monk or a nun for the rest of my life. <laughs> Can I expand the time and energy that it might take to develop a friend. Let me read another part of the passage to you. Verses 9 through 13. Love, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Giddy up, JBU. You got a homework assignment. You could have that posture all four years in a row and never probably be able to figure all those things out. But aren't they beautiful and can't wait for you to try to start living them. I saw hospitality happen when I left last night or two nights ago. You guys have a fire pit here. Somebody was out there building the giant pit and I was imagining people roaming around a little hospitality moment. Do you imagine being able to invite just a couple of people and go, hey, I hardly know you, but you've got this little warm thing called a fire and people like huddle up next to it and, and you don't have to look each other in the eye. You just stare at the fire and you can grunt or moan or say things and maybe create a friendship or start one or investigate one. What I love about this whole stack of words that is here is it gives all the possibilities in the world. Rejoice with people, have hope with people, be patient with people, per, uh, persevere in prayer with people, show hospitality. There are so many little things that now can move into the outwardly directly. And so here's what I want to do. I want to give you a couple just basic ideas of things that I've tried to challenge students I've worked with over the years. And here's one of them. I want you to risk the deeper conversations and connection. I think you can go through three or four years of college and never break into a serious conversation and only talk about Marvel and only talk about the food in the calf and only talk about what are you going to do this weekend and never get anywhere deeper. Take a risk. A God conversation, not a God debate. 
By the way, remember that John 15, 15 that I just, man, Jesus wants to call us friend. And they were wrestling with, talking with the kingdom. What is the kingdom? I don't get the kingdom. Could you imagine safe conversations with faculty, with peers, with students, with staff members, with administrators that is about who is God and how do we love and follow God together rather than you better watch out. I got a 12 point argument. I'm a bam. I'm going to be right. These conversations can change so much if we look at them as conversations and we take the risk to go deeper. One of my favorite things that I asked uh, APU students when they would come into my office was this, hey, do you and your friends ever talk about God? And the amount of times that I heard go, well, yeah, in the class and, you know, in, in our discipleship group, I'm like, no, like around the fire pit, like uh, around bacon brownies, around a hike. Do you ever talk about God? They're like, ah, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It's really personal. I'm like, aren't friends personal? And, and I tried to normalize how can God come out in your conversations? Here's another one that I would do with them all the time. I love this right here. I would love to ask people, hey, do you pray with your friends? They're like, oh yeah, when we have a prayer meeting and we gather and it's like an hour long thing. I'm like, no, do you, like, do you ever wake up when your roommate's like leaving early because they have a test and they don't feel prepared and you just like barely lift up your head and you go, hey bro, I'm praying for your test and then put your head back down. And they're like, no, that's weird. I'm, no, I'm like, no, that's awesome. That's friendship. I had the, these football players come and join me. They're like, hey, Woody. I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And I'll go around and talk to them. They're like, uh, we think you're kind of weird, but uh, we tried that prayer thing. And it's actually meant a lot to our, to our apartment. Thank you. We don't pray long, but we'll be laying in bed at night. And if we're all in there at the same time, there's three of us. All of a sudden, someone will go, hey, you guys want to pray real quick? And one of them will say, I'm not very good at it, but sure, what do you want me to pray for you? The deeper conversations, the conversations with God, the conversations with each other. JBU, if you want friendships where God reigns and bears and lions and goats and sheep and lamb and vipers and kids start doing life together, God's got to be weaved into the fabric of what that community looks like. Romans 12, 14 through 18 says this, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Man, there's like 12 sermons there. And I think Keith is going to uh, be available afterwards to do an, a 24-hour sermon on Romans chapter 12. Um, was there anything that was, yeah, I heard somebody clap, man. They're ready for you. Anybody hear anything that they're like, ouch. Do you know relationships produce ouches? Do you know your friends will let you down? Do you know you will let other people down? One of the things I'm most excited about in you uh, uh, reimagining or living into friendships with God's reign and rule, you can now start to look at conflict and ouches as possibilities for God to do reconciling, forgiving work that will actually make you friends like you've never been friends before. When people give up on friendships, when I'm tempted to give up on friendships because there's one conflict, I guess we never even got past that 40 hours that we were looking to do. If you want a true friendship, the best friendships are the ones that figure out how to say to one another, I am so sorry, will you please forgive me? By the way, that's almost as hard to say as I love you. And that's almost as hard to say, hey, you're a really good friend to me. I appreciate you. Thank you. Because all three of those statements are vulnerable and they open us up. But the only way to be true friends is to get opened it up inwardly directed, opening up so that we can be outwardly committed makes all the difference in the world. Man, don't throw fire and venom back, even if it's been thrown at you. N.T. Wright says, revenge keeps evil in circulation. You know what destroys friendships is when people just keep lobbing back and forth what was done to them they want to do back to somebody else. You have the opportunity 
You have up until Thanksgiving and Christmas. You got a semester that's almost half done. Do you realize as you do life together, you can be in a posture that might begin a friendship that could last a week, a month, a year, 20 years, 50 years. You could be a friend to somebody that has never had a friend like you before. The experiences God wants to provide for you will change you and will change those around you. And there's the chance that the crazy hope-filled zoo might be possible. I want to put up that painting again one more time because now that we've talked through Romans 12 and you've imagined um, the students at APU trying to figure this out, maybe you can try to imagine figuring it out. Uh, Right now, today, which one of those would be you? Are you kind of off to the edge of this painting and distancing yourself and have your back turned on the possibility of friendship because you've been hurt, harmed, and fouled so much you're not sure if you want to try again? Are you someone who is in a good place because you've, in view of God's mercy, have a great relationship in the upward, uh, obedient kind of direction, and uh, right now you're able just to bless and encourage and speak truth over someone that's wounded? Are you with people that are rejoicing and praising God? Are you being patient whether a friendship is one week or two years or five years old? God wants to do a new work that only God could do. Which one of these is you right now and which one would you hope God could help you to be? JBU, I wanna thank you for a little bit of friendship. I was only here for three days And I didn't get 40 hours with anybody, but I actually think uh, when you discover that you serve the same Savior and you are in the same family of God, your friendship crowd expands pretty fast and pretty quick. And as I flew here, I would fly over cities and I'd go, oh, that's where Michael lives. That's where Jason lives. I know Katie and her husband live there. And I was like praying for people as I was flying over cities. It's the silliest thing in the world, but like, God has given me so many friends in the sense that we are in the family of God together. And this week, I got to talk to some of you. And I will never be the same even in just a two-minute conversation with some of you and some of you even a longer one. Today, I thank my God for Amber. I thank my God for Ira. I thank my God for Jason, for Gary and Derek and Keith. I thank my God for Hannah and Isabel, people who pointed me back to what it means to be in the family of God and to be a friend. And if I don't get to develop with that, uh, with you for a long period of time, don't worry. Someday you and I will be together for all eternity celebrating what our God could only do in us. And the bears, the lions, the goats, the sheep, the crazy hope-filled zoo could be something different. Lord Jesus, You can do things that we could never do on our own. Would you help this community be friends to one another? Would they belong to one another? Would they be in harmony with one another? As long as it depends upon them, would there be peace in this community? Would no one feel left out? Would no one be excluded? Would no one be trampled over? I pray, Lord Jesus, that this community would reflect what you are like. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on. And we'd love it if you would leave us a review.